First, I will elaborate the distinction I am drawing between social institutions and constitutive social orders, and then consider where the idea that all social facts should be considered as constituted by social institutions came from. Both social institutions and interaction orders are constitutive of the sense of social facts within them. The essential difference is the dependence of the process on the mutual reciprocity that is not mediated in which participants are responsible for to one another and which does not involve an appeal to accountability to hierarchy. This difference results in a domain of fragile enacted objects on the one hand whose empirical characteristics are specifiable by rules and essential to their mutual intelligibility and a domain of conceptual and merely accountable objects on the other whose empirical details are not recoverable from or essential to their accountable adequacy. The entities I am calling social institutions, one, have formal sets of rules, usually written down somewhere, but specifiable by members of the institution in any case. Two, those who belong to or work for the institution are accountable to those formal rules, but the rules are not adequate to specify how they should be followed. As a consequence, three, a vocabulary of motives, accounts, justifications, about the relationship between actions and the rule set develops. Four, people who happen to be in the institution but not of the institution are not accountable to these rules, although they may be accountable by institutional workers to one another in institu institutional terms. If they are habitually in but not of the institution, like prison inmates, they may also develop their own vocabulary of accounts about their relationship to the institution. Why does 1974 elaboration of the inmate code is an empirical illustration of this phenomenon? 5. There is usually a referee of some sort that is someone higher up in the institutional hierarchy with the authority to arbitrate disputes over accounts and accountable matters. Participants in social institutions are not, at, not all equal. Constitutive interaction orders, by contrast with social institutions, one, do not have written rules. If you ask people who engage in them, they usually cannot specify the rules and will often say that they are not following rules, but there are rules nevertheless. Two, sometimes constitutive practices, practices are done so often that, like greetings, they seem to have become little routines or rituals, but there are many ways to do this and their form, content, and context are not often specified as in rituals. Where they are so specified as in ritual greetings of heads of state, they are institutional orders and not constitutive interaction orders. Three, whereas rituals and institutions have designated presiders who are referees and performers are accountable both to the specifications of the ritual or institution they are engaged in and to the referee for the adequacy of their performance. In constitutive orders, participants are responsible directly to one another and are expected to repair troubles quickly as and when they occur, using constitutive sequential orders to do so. Accounts are not a preferred way of dealing with such troubles. If troubles occur, and are not quickly resolved sequentially, 
it can be taken as evidence of either a participant's incompetence or lack of commitment. Four, therefore, constitutive interaction orders do not develop a vocabulary of motive account. A. This is partly because there is no referee to which such an account would appeal. The primary persons to whom participants are responsible are the ones with whom they are directly engaged. B. But it is also because interaction is organized around the probability that difficulties will continually arise in the production of a mutually sustainable order and need constant attending to. Trying to repair these via accounts would involve a continual infinite regress. The rules orient this need. Because of this, there, because of this, there are many ways at every point in a conversation of repairing troubles without needing to resort to giving an account. 5. So, needing to give an account in an ordinary conversation unless there is some institutionally mandated relevance at issue, is already evidence of a failure. All the account could do is name a causal factor that interfered with their normal attention to the practice. I couldn't hear over the noise, or I didn't see you, and these kinds of problems can be more efficiently achieved sequentially. Huh, or a question repeat. These accounts have the character of naming interferences with the practice in question and thus are not like an institutional vocabulary of motives in any case. One of the problems in sorting out the two types of social order is that they are typically both present. For instance, when people who are working in a formal institutional setting do their work, they must make use of constitutive orders of practice to get that work done. But they are also held accountable at the same time for doing that work in institutionally accountable terms. The differences between the two sorts of order make contradictions inevitable. In most cases, work requires adhe adherence to constitutive practices that nevertheless must be accounted for in institutional terms. Even in causal conversations, uh, casual conversations, institutionally relevant identities sometimes intrude, and in such cases an institutional vocabulary of accounts may become relevant. This overlay of the two types of order has obscured their distinctiveness, but the fact that they are often found together should not be allowed to obscure the differences. Diruke was one of the first to point out that unless a set of rules for understanding how a set of actions were to be interpreted existed before the action was undertaken and were known to all of the parties involved social action could not be mutually meaningful. He referred to actions that accorded with such pre-existing sets of rules as social institutions. He called the mutual intelligibilities that they made possible social facts and argued that a new discipline of sociology was required to study these social facts. So we might say that the insistence that all social facts must be the result of some relationship to social institutions is Durkheim's contribution to sociology. But it is also the case that Durkheim made an important distinction between types of social facts. And this is where an essential misreading of Durkheim has played an important role in obscuring the distinction he made between two kinds of social order that is relevant to the distinction between social institutions and constitutive orders of interaction. The point of the division of labor in society was to elaborate this distinction between two social orders and their respective social facts 
and its relevance to relevance for a sociological study of morality in traditional societies, according to Juroken, in which all members of the group could be constrained by kinship and religious ties to believe in the same things. Social facts of even an ordinary everyday kind could be constituted in relation to social institutions. Evans Pictures, 1944 study of what he characterized as circular thinking among the Azande is an illustration of this phenomenon. Anything that occurs can be give, given a mutually intelligible meaning among a group who share the same religious or cultural orientation, assuming it is sufficiently well elaborated. In more highly differentiated modern societies, however, in which the division of labor puts diverse groups of people into constant contact, such traditional ways of constituting mutual intelligibility by convention would no longer work. In such societies, Durkheim argued, some new way of achieving both mutual intelligibility and social solidarity would be required. This new form of solidarity would need to be free from institutional constraint and would require reciprocity and equal exchange to work. Something that could be characterized as justice would become necessary. This was the focus of Durkheim's much misunderstood book three of the division of labor on abnormal forms. On this view, modernity could be seen as ushering in a new era in which justice and equality are a requirement for mutual understanding and self, beginning with the shared practices of occupational groups. Durkheim characterized this new order as constitutive and anomie in modern society as a constitutive lack. Unfortunately, Durkheim has been interpreted as having argued that collective representations based on ritual and shared belief are necessary in both traditional and modern so social forms and that social solidarity in modern society has been weakened because we no longer share such collective representations. His argument was much more complicated. Towards the end of the text, Durkheim emphasized the point that while collective sentiments and representations that are based on likeness do become important as the division of labor increases, this is not a problem and does not leave society without moral solidarity. What gives unity to organized societies, he argues, as to all organisms, is the spontaneous consensus of parts. Such is the internal solidarity, which not only is as indispensable as the regulative, tra regulative action of higher centers, but which also is their necessary condition for they do no more than translate it into another language and, so to speak, consecrate it. Solidarity in the division of labor, according to Durkin, is a spontaneous process that cannot be produced by constraint. Forms of solidarity based on spontaneous reciprocities of practice, like modern science, and the rules that translate them will take the place of constraint. Because these forms of solidarity are just as collective as the form of social solidarity based on constraint that they replace, it has been a mistake to see modernity as the domain of individualism. Because they misunderstood this aspect of the phenomena, certain moralists have claimed that the division of labor does not produce true solidarity. They have seen in it only particular exchanges, ephemeral combinations without past or future, in which the individual is thrown to his own resources. They have not perceived the slow work of consolidation 
the network of links, which little by little have been woven and which makes something permanent of organic solidarity. These new social forms are coordinated by networks of rules and reciprocities that ensure consistency in practices. They develop from the bottom up and are only translated by regulation from above. The problem of modernity is that of inhabiting a transition phase in which formal regulations do not adequately translate the constitutive orders of practice that have developed, still trying instead to constrain them. The misinterpretation of this argument is prevalent and problematic. It has led, among other things, to the misconception that Durkheim argued that a lack of formal institutional or legal constraint in modern society leads to anomie. It has led also to interpreting the social problems characterizing the transition to modernity as arising from a lack of social solidarity and the rise of individualism and attributing that position to Durkheim. Whereas Durkheim argued that these problems are evidence that the transition is not complete, a great nostalgia for lost community characterizes theories of modernity. But collective representations were not the truth, and few of us would want to return to the unjust and unfree social arrangements of the past. The possibility of a conception of truth in any modern sense as not determined by the culture or institution requires the replacement of collective representations and institutional constraint with spontaneous and constitutive self-organizing practices that are con unconstrained by particular institutional beliefs and values. This was Durkheim's point. Contemporary research supporting the claim that constitutive interactional orders provide a foundation for human identity and sense-making give this argument a new set of teeth. The idea of constitutive interaction orders of practice promises not only to transform the understanding of social order, but also to facilitate a long overdue rapprochement between sociology and philosophy on matters of the social construction of personhood and mutual understanding, the relationship between truth and social practices and their relevance to ethics, a rapprochement between a sociology of constitutive interaction order and philosophers in interested in language and ethics would return sociology to its original purpose. Durkheim's original warrant for sociology as a discipline being its relevance as moral philosophy. While sociology was intended to take up such questions, the years between Durkheim and Garfinkel Goffman offer little evidence of such concern. A great deal has been written about values, norms, and beliefs, but with the exception of a few sociologists of constitutive order, only as contingent matters of culture and usually with a focus on those inequitable power relations that socially institutions, social institutions seem inevitably to support. Little attention has been paid to the idea that equality and freedom are also social productions depending on constitutive social commitment or that a sociological analysis of the logics of constitutive orders and an examination of their dependence on working consensus reciprocities could shed light on the essential questions of what equality and freedom justice might look like and how they could be achieved.